Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, as always, I pray that this message is yours, that it moves past our ears and our minds into our hearts and from our hearts to our lives and our conversations. Help us be the people of your pasture. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Well, we are right in the middle of a sermon series here on Wednesday evenings. And the question that we're answering as part of the sermon series is answering this. How do I engage the people of this culture with the gospel of Christ lovingly, truthfully, and courageously? Now remember, this is now the eighth in this series, the eighth time we're talking about this, okay? So we've been talking about it for a while. However, the question of should we engage the wider culture with the gospel of Jesus has already been answered. All authority in heaven and earth has been given me, Jesus said. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the answer to the question, should I engage this culture, has already been answered. You are either a missionary. By the way, missionary does that mean going to far off distant lands. When do you enter the mission field? When you leave this parking lot. If you are a Christian, you are a missionary. So every Christian is either a missionary or they're an imposter. You can't love Jesus without wanting to tell the world about Jesus. Okay, that's been answered. But how to do it in this day and age? That's what we're answering. The theme verse is Galatians 2.20. I hope you're beginning to commit it to memory. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you were baptized, God placed his name on you. When you believe in Jesus Christ, the old identity is killed. And you're given a new identity, and that new identity is Jesus Christ. The reason this is so important is because this culture that we're living in right now, and it's not just today. They've been doing this for millennia. But this culture tries to divide you and make your first identity the color of your skin Make your first identity how much money you make, your education. This culture is trying to make it so that your first identity is male or female. This culture is trying to identify you by those characteristics. But you have a new identity. You are baptized. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So your first primary identity is child of God. That's what's happened. Now, when that happens, your goal becomes his goal. Well, excuse me. His goal, better stated. His goal is now your goal. And what is God's chief goal for humanity? To have a relationship with him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The whole reason he sent Jesus was because you and I were lost. We could not find our way back home. We weren't smart enough. We couldn't behave well enough. And God did not sit in his heaven and say, well, if they ask me to save them, I will. If they come to me. No, what did he do? He went. And he saved the world through the blood of Jesus Christ by dying on a cross and rise again. God never asks you to do a thing that he hasn't already fulfilled himself. So when he says go and make disciples, what he means is I made you and I'm sending you to this culture. Okay, there we go. We're all on the same page. Now, <clears throat> there's two ways to share the gospel of Jesus. With the words in your mouth, and I'm not going to limit this. This is absolutely essential. You cannot 
you cannot tell people about Jesus without actually what? Telling people about Jesus. But there is an equally important way to show people Jesus, and that's the behavior of their life and actions. Those two things need to be in concert. Now, what happens a lot of times in churches is they highlight one of those two things. They either are big on evangelism using the words, which I am, you know me, I have always been big on evangelism, all right? So they're either that or they focus on mercy and acts of mercy and love and all this very important thing. It shouldn't be either or, should it? It should be both. Those things need to be wedded. Think of the Christ himself. Think of the Christ himself. Did Jesus speak? He taught in synagogues. He taught in boats. He taught on a mountain. He taught on hills. He taught in the wilderness. Any time he had an opportunity to speak about the kingdom of God, he spoke it. But did he also live a particular kind of life? Absolutely. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He walked on water. He fed the 5,000. He called Zacchaeus from the tree. He sat down with Pharisees. He kept the woman caught in adultery safe. His life proved the message. They were in concert together. How many of us know people? I don't need a show of hands. How many of us know people that say they love Jesus but their life doesn't quite match up with what they're saying. I like to call these people a book that we've preached on. They're Christian atheists. They live as if there is no God. But when you ask them, they say they believe. The simple fact of the matter is that's impossible, isn't it? So both of these things show the wider world Jesus Christ. We've all heard the phrase before. I didn't write the blue skit. Beth did. She didn't even know I was going to use this phrase, but it worked out really well. If you're going to talk the talk, what? You got to walk the walk. Most of the time, Christians don't evangelize because they inwardly know that their life, what? Doesn't match. Their life doesn't match. All right, <clears throat> there are two verses of scripture I want to highlight right now. I want them both on the screen. Uh, keep your conduct, first one is 1 Peter 2, and the second one is 2 Corinthians. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. I'm going to keep that up uh, for the people here in the sanctuary. Let's take the, the first thing first. Bible-believing Christians today, sadly, and I'll bet you even when I say you got to walk the walk, in your brain, I'll bet you, you had a whole bunch of things that you're not allowed to do. When people hear living the Christian life, they almost always hear it in negative terms. Don't drink too much. Don't do drugs. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman, so you can't be two men and get married. You can't be two women and get married. Don't be greedy. Don't lie. When we talk about walking the walk, even in our own brains, it's almost always identified as by what we can't do. The wider culture defines Christians by what they're against instead of what they are for. When I say walk the walk, what I actually mean is your life should show that you, not what you're against, I'm against drinking, I'm against smoking. I'm against uh, this. I'm against that. I'm against this. I'm a good Christian because I'm against all the right things. 
When I say walk the walk, what I mean is your life should show that you are authentically, deeply in love with Jesus. That's all I mean. For example, I hope it continues this way, but on the altar of God, I'll tell you this. I have not cheated on my wife, okay? Uh, amen. I'm living. Uh, all right. I'm alive. Why don't I cheat on my wife? Is it because that I find guys lie all the time? I'm just telling you, ladies, they lie. They lie. There's no other women attractive but you, baby. That's a lie. All right? And every man knows that that's a lie, okay? It's not because there are no other attractive women on earth. If that were the case, there wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar pornography industry that seems to be very effective for Christian lying men. I'm being serious, right? Because those men lie. I would never do that. Well, that's because you're a liar. Okay. Why haven't I cheated on my wife? It's not because there's a big fat commandment that says don't commit adultery. What an immature, silly reason. So I don't cheat on my wife so that God doesn't send me to hell? That's an immature, stupid reason. Why don't I cheat on my wife? Because I love her. Do you see the difference? It's not because God says don't do it. The motivation is love. The Christian's motivation is love of Jesus Christ. I love her too much. I don't want to see that face. You follow what I'm trying to say? It's love. What is the Christian for? I'm for being there for the hurting. I'm for being there for the sinner. Calling them to repentance, of course, but being there for them. I'm for spreading the gospel of Jesus. I'm for showing compassion. Christianity, should, you should be known by what you are for, not by what you are against. Live your con keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Now what's going to happen is they'll still lie about you. They'll still hate you. All right? And because we do speak about what God's truth is, they'll hate you. But look what it says. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you, because what? They're going to do it. The other mistake Christians make are they look at the news and they're like, I just can't believe they think that way. They've been thinking this way since the beginning. I just can't believe. How could they possibly think that way? Because they're filled with sin the same way you were until Jesus changed you. So when they speak against you as evildoers, they're going to see your life, and your life will convict them, and they will repent so that they will glorify God on the day of visitation. Because what's your chief goal? Is your chief goal your promotion? Is your chief goal that you're unoffended? Is your chief goal that you get the respect you deserve? Or is your chief goal saving your baby? If your goal is God's goal, your chief priority is saving your baby. Amen. <laughs> Amen, Tees. Amen. That's the chief goal. It's that simple. Then it goes on and it says, we are the aroma of Christ. The olfactory senses. By the way, I keep on itching my nose. I can feel something. I hope I'm not making a fool of myself and you're all looking at something coming out of my nose. Anyway, uh, for we are the aroma of Christ. Aroma, the olfactory senses, are the most powerful sense, aren't they? Doesn't a smell bring you back? It can bring you back 30 years. My grandmother's house, do you know houses have smells? Do you know that? They really do. People do too. You can walk in your, that's my grandma's house. My grandma has been long dead since 1995 or something like that. But when I smell a particular smell, Grandma. And what this says is we are the aroma of Christ. Paul is talking. And he's saying when I enter into this church, this city, this town, I bring the aroma of Jesus. Meaning everybody that meets me, 
knows that they have encountered what? Jesus. Some of them, it's an aroma of death. If they refuse to believe, it's an aroma of death. It's disgusting to them. They want to shut it down. They want to cancel it. They, uh, and, and that's what the woke culture wants to do. It's an aroma of death to them. But you're so mad about being offended that you stopped witnessing. Paul says, yeah, it's an aroma of death to those that are dying. But they know the smell. But it's an aroma of life to those that are being saved. I, uh, for those of you that know me, I have strong opinions. Um, no, it's true. It's true. So I was with a member of the congregation yesterday that disagrees with me. I have to learn that people are allowed to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> I was with a member of the church that disagrees with me on some tertiary things and they were here for communion and I gave them way too much Chris and way too little Christ if that makes sense I gave them a whole lot of Chris I'm going to show you why you're wrong I'm going to tell you I'm going to show you why you're wrong uh, I mean <laughs> clearly they're still wrong but uh, no Sometimes that's what happens to people in my boat that are like me. Some Christians don't speak. They're timid. They're fearful. Other Christians mix their opinion with the gospel. When they left, and everything's good, everything's good, trust me. But when they left, they left with the aroma of Chris, not the aroma of Christ. Does that make sense? They knew exactly what Chris was thinking but they didn't know what Christ was thinking. My job in that role was to give them Jesus, not to give them me. Okay, so this is why it's hard. We're Americans. We're convinced that we are what? We're right. Now can you not think like me? When in reality, we're called to give them Jesus. And Jesus does an amazing job. That's the, pro that's the point. Chris is maybe a little too arrogant, as if Jesus can't do a good job. You give him Jesus, and what will Jesus do? He'll change them. I actually saw a meme today from one of the members of our, so yeah, talk the talk, walk the walk, this meme. Uh, I think Mary put it out there. Christian, it's not our job to straighten everybody out. Why, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And by straightening everybody out, that means it's our job to make everybody think like Chris. Ah, uh, Christian, it's not our job to straighten everybody out, but it is our job to show everybody the unconditional love of Jesus. And that hit me today um, because that is our job. So we tell the truth. We're unafraid to speak the truth, but we speak that truth with compassion, love, and honor. And when they get offended and when they wrong you, instead of us making a big fuss, let's try and follow the advice of Jesus. If someone strikes you on the one cheek, what? Turn the, if someone forces you, that's the word he uses, forces you one mile, what? If someone steals your cloak, give him your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you. And what? Do you remember? Do not demand it back. You want to know why this culture is the way that it is? Because too many Christians that act just like the culture. How many Christians do you know are turning the other cheek? How many Christians are wrongly being brought one mile and they're walking too? How many? You want to show this culture Jesus, it's not about getting them to think like you yet. It's about giving them Jesus. Giving them the truth. Hide nothing. I hide nothing. You must do both. 
We must talk the talk and walk the walk. <clears throat> that right there is a witness. The other person sees, they witness the change. Now, once again, I didn't ask permission, but he has to forgive me because he's Christian. <laughs> Graham, about 10 years ago, became an authentic Christian by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. So he was friends with a guy that he calls Big Steve. This was Big Steve, right? Big Steve is like nine feet tall, 600 pounds. Big Steve is Big Steve. All right, he's Big Steve. Uh, and Graham said, he, he, I, I, I lift weights with Graham, and, and Graham said something cool to me the other day. He said, you know, Big Steve and I were talking, and Big Steve said, out of the blue, you are a completely different human being. I knew you before, and I know you now. And you are a completely different human being. Jesus has completely changed you. I knew Graham before, and I knew Graham after. Jesus has completely changed you, brother. Look at it. Look at his little, cute little Filipino wife. Oh, Big Steve's right. Big Steve is so right. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's funny. Now, my point is, I actually don't know if Graham has actually opened up his mouth and fully witnessed to Steve. I, I don't know that. What I do know is that even if he hadn't, what witnessed to Steve? The change. And he knows it's Jesus, so I guess Graham has said something. Does that make sense? He knows it's Jesus. He didn't even have to ask, why are you so different? What he said was, dude, Jesus has changed you. You are different. That's a witness to this culture. Amen? Amen. God is good all the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Help us to witness to an unbelieving secular age. In the name of Jesus, amen.